We are recording. You know what? I don't know if I if I shared sound, Joe. So I'm gonna reshare. Yep, I got it. Sound. All right, welcome everybody to Optometric Education Consultants National Webinar Series, uh, Tuesday night edition. Tonight's topic is amniotic membranes and biologic agents for the eye. It's an interactive distance learning course with our guest speaker and uh, co-owner and co-partner, uh, Greg Caldwell. He's a 1995 graduate of the Pennsylvania College of Optometry, and he also completed a one-year residency in primary care and ocular disease at the Eye Institute, uh, as well as Hahnemann Hospital. He's a fellow of the American Academy of Optometry, a diplomate of the American Board of Optometry, a member of the Optometric Glaucoma Society, and the, a member of the Optometric Wellness and Nutrition Society. He currently works in Dunson, Duncansville, Pennsylvania, as an ocular disease consultant. His primary focus is the diagnosis and management of anterior and posterior segment ocular disease. He's been a participant in multiple FDA clinical investigator trials. He has integrated nutrition, prevention, and wellness into his patient care. He fully practices integrative optometry. He is a co-founder of Optometric Education Consultants and co-administrator of OCT Connect on Facebook, which is really a wonderful resource uh, for people to share their images and, and learn from one another. He's lectured extensively throughout the country in over 13 countries internationally. In 2010, he was the president of the Pennsylvania Optometric Association and has served on the AOA Board of Trustees from 2013 to 2016. And he's president of the Blair Clearfield Association for the Blind. So with that, please give a nice, warm, virtual round of applause to our speaker, my friend and partner, Dr. Greg Caldwell. Joe, thank you. Thanks very much for a nice introduction there. And truly an honor and a pleasure to be here tonight with the colleagues across the country to speak on this topic. Um, disclosures, um, this was independently prepared by me. I have a whole list there of Allergan to Hero and advisory boards. I, you know, really put that up here, not to really impress people, but, uh, you know, to guy in Duncansville, Pennsylvania, to be able to to be able to share knowledge to colleagues, I just need to kind of be plugged in. And that's just one way of being plugged in. Uh, no financial uh, proprietary interest to any of the companies that we've been mentioned here tonight. Um, I am the PA medical director for Involve. I do sit as the chair of macular degeneration and diabetes for the healthcare registries. And I guess the most important is the content and the format of this course will be presented without commercial bias and does not claim any superiority. And Joe mentioned half owner of Optometric Education Consultants. So I'm going to start off real quick. And Joe, I have it here. So I'm going to start off with a poll. And, uh, you know, I consider amniotic membrane treatment, allopathic, conventional medicine, alternative medicine, integrative medicine. So just real quick here, just kind of want to see where everyone feels on that. You know, Greg, as uh, people are, are weighing in, rather than have that air, I'd like to, like to share a couple uh, uh, things with you. I think it's uh, <clears throat> kind of fat, you know, kind of fascinating. Allopathic medicine, people, some people don't understand it. You know, that that's the traditional MD. And I know this uh, one fellow who remained remain nameless, really, really good ophthalmologist, and he, you know, he always knew that I worked with him in osteopathic. Oop, I think we might have lost Joe. All right, Joe, you there? Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. Um, there you go. You're back. Yeah. So, you know, he always asked me about the osteopathic college, and I, I talked about allopathic and, and osteopathic medicine. And I mentioned to him, I said, you know, you, you, you've got an MD, you, you're an allopath. He goes, no, not, I'm an MD. Well, no. Well, yeah, but you're an allopathic. Well, no, I went to medical school. Well, yeah, you went to allopathic medical school. I said, well, no, no, I went to medical school. And after a while, I just gave up. There you go. <laughs> but allopathic is conventional MD medicine. There you go. So allopathic, uh, I'm going to end the poll. I'll share the poll. All right, so we have allopathic being 38%. We got 58, 
57% and 5% say an alternative. So that's so why I put this slide in here. And Joe was talking about allopathic medicine in terms we use, you know, modern or mainstream medicine, conventional medicine, Western medicine, you know, biomedicine, you know, the key aloe just means opposites. So if you have an infection, you use an anti-infective, um, you have inflammation, you use an anti-inflammatory, so on and so forth. So basically opposites cure. In the healthcare system, this is what most of what we see here today and uh, using medication, surgery, therapies, and procedures. Now, complementary and integrative medicines are commonly used along with mainstream medicine. That's naturopathy or maybe uh, chiropractic care or Chinese medicine, homeopathy. And, uh, and what we're seeing is homeopathic and modern schools have recently added more uh, like information of nutrition and food and that's where I've spent like the last four or five years, as Joe mentioned during my bio there, that uh, I've been taking a lot of, if you want to say, root cause, nutrition. Uh, we all do it. And if you're doing an amniotic membrane, uh, I, I don't recall the what the statistics were whenever I did the polling question there. Um, but if you're doing an amniotic membrane, in a sense, you're doing uh, integrative optometry, integrative care, because it's a natural, uh, comes from a placenta. This isn't like pharmaceutical derived that we're going to talk about the second half. So amniotic membranes are a natural biologic approach. But when we get to the biologics that are made um, that's kind of your pharmaceutical type, modern medicine. And, you know, let's say you can use Oxervate and an amniotic membrane uh, for a condition, then what you're doing is doing integrative. So anyone out there that in a sense is using hypochlorous acid and tea tree oil out there to, to with that Demodex, using fish oil, using amniotic membranes, using AREDs or, or any type of natural product, to a treat that disease and maybe using other things and steroids and the modern approach, you're complementing or doing complementary medicine, or you're integrating kind of a nutritional or root cause approach. Um, and then there are some of us that just do it at a deeper level. So you might be kind of integrative 101 or, you know, integrative 201, 301, so on and so forth. But it's a natural approach. And the history of amniotic membranes uh, in ophthalmic surgery that goes back as far as 1940. But it wasn't until 1995 where uh, Kim and Sang used amniotic membrane tissue for ocular surface reconstruction. And then 1997, surgical and sutured, but it was 2005 when Procara, the single sheet retained uh, polycarbonate in office, sutureless came out. And then it kind of sat, you know, quiet for a while until some of the dehydrated uh, membranes came out in 2012 and 2013. Now, how this all comes about is, is that we know that there is different types of you know, in utero healing than adult healing. So I think we're all familiar that, you know, whenever you get a cut or a wound, you get the kind of that inflammatory response, platelet, neutrophils, then the macrophages, the monocyte turns into the macrophage when it moves into the interstitial fluid or space, you form lymphocytes, and then you have myo, fibroblast and scarring. That's just kind of the adult wound healing. It's different in utero. So when you hear regeneration or repair, regenerative cell tissue reproduction, that is no scar. Repair is healing by the traditional way that I just walked us through. That's granulation, that's scar formation. So scarring correlates directly with that inflammatory response, all those interleukins uh, that we talk about. And this is really the key here is what we want is we have this wound, but instead of filling this wound in with a, uh, a scar tissue, we want to re replace it with as close to possible as the cell tissue reproduction. So amniotic membrane regenerative wound healing uh, shares the same cell origin as the fetus. It's got stem cell behavior and it takes away that, say, that controversy of stem cell approach. And we have the structurally similar to all tissues. 
And what happens is we steer away in a natural way rather than maybe you know, a steroid, which would be an allopathic approach, kind of using a, a, a naturopathic approach of steering away from inflammation, new blood, blood vessel growth, scarring, uh, and rejection. And the amniotic membrane uh, is the most inner lining of the placenta or what's called the amnion. Uh, as we can see here, it's the amnion. Uh, we really don't want any chorion because that could be uh, inflammatory. So I like showing this, the structure and of the, of the fetal membrane. Uh, as we can see up here where my pointer is, we have amniotic fluid. And then you can see here's the amnion down to this kind of red line right through here, this area right here. And then down below, you can see is chorion. And really, we just want the amniotic membrane uh, for, this, uh, for this procedure. But I love looking at the, the components here. You can see epithelium, basement membrane, collagen, one, three, five, and six. And you can see down here, you have laminin, fibronectin. You know, those are all just components that we're used to being in that conjunctiva uh, in cornea. So you can just see how well, again, they complement or integrate uh, with, uh, with some of the disease process out there. So regenerative tissue engineering, you know, it's an innovative biologic approach. So that's why I wanted to do biologic agents kind of natural tonight meshing in with some of the biologics that we're, we're hearing about uh, for thyroid eye disease, neurotrophic keratitis, uh, and some other ones that have some eye implications that we will talk about. And again, that platform with that complex extracellular matrix are in a natural way, anti-inflammatory, anti-scarring, and anti-angiogenic, promoting stem cell expansion I uh, really never um, knew the power of the amniotic membrane to suppress pain uh, until I did a recurrent coronal erosion and literally debrided limbus to limbus, put the cryopreserved membrane on there and uh, had the patient come back the next day. And she's like, yeah, it feels like there's something in my eye. And I'm like, wow, that's pretty impressive. You know, limbo to limbo and taking some Tylenol and uh, ibuprofen. Didn't even have to move into the, to the narcotic uh, side of things. Uh, promoting cellular migration and obviously increasing uh, the recovery. So inflammation is the hallmark of really, you know, all diseases, you know, cornea inflammation, all these itises, you know, keratitis, conjunctivitis, blepharitis. So inflammation is, is the key and having something that in a sense naturally can steer away, um, then you know, cuts back on allergy uh, and other types of, of uh, unwanted inflammations or allergic reactions, uh, which, which makes it nice. So it's just different uh, outcomes of tissue injury. Um, so right here in big red, you see we have a, you know, injury to the tissue. Uh, we're used to that kind of pass, passive pathway where you have uncontrolled uh, inflammation, you get more tissue damage. And then uh, as you get the healing process, you can have ulceration, you can have scar formation. And especially in that cornea, you can get some vision loss that's out there. In an active pathway, you're, you're controlling that inflammation, promoting uh, healing, and you get exact replacement. And that's when you hear about, you know, regenerative type of healing versus, you know, your passive way of healing. So passive is, you know, is a single action therapy that may induce inflammation or can uh, delay the healing. And we're all kind of used to these. Um, in a sense, we use therapeutic contact lenses uh, to provide mechanical protection, put it over that abrasion uh, and to help, um, you know, to reduce the infection. We use steroids or NSAIDs to reduce inflammation, to, to delay the, the healing uh, and promote uh, and to uh, stop potential or flare up of infections that are out there. And when we get into acting, where you're kind of having a dual mechanism, mechanism of action, controlling inflammation and promoting that scarless, we're talking about amniotic membranes, again, controlling the inflammation, preventing additional damage 
and uh, promotes and accelerates wound healing. And I can tell you now, I use a lot of amniotic membranes in the practice. And I do that in a sense, conjunction if someone comes in uh, with a, uh, like a, uh, an infectious ulcer. Um, you know, if it's like a, a herpes simplex right on the visual axis, sure, I'm going to use things like um, uh, Valtrex or maybe even do Zirgan, but say to the patient, look, let's get ahead of some of this inflammation and potential scarring and uh, put an amniotic membrane on there. Now, you know, alternative medicine would be like, hey, we don't need Valtrex. Hey, we don't need um, you know, uh, 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 a Zergan, maybe we'd say like, go natural, let's use some L lysine and then do an amniotic membrane. Right. So, um, you know, there might be someone out there doing it, but that's where you hear about alternative medicine. Again, integrative would be complementary or integrative, integrating some naturopathic ways. And again, this would be the, uh, the amniotic membrane. Great, uh, Greg. If I may interrupt, uh, just just to get a clarification for for the audience and myself, you've got a person who comes in; they're complaining of irritation, and you see a dendritic ulcer. How are you going to prescribe for that? Are you going to prescribe Valtrex and an amniotic membrane? Are you going to prescribe medicines first and then do an? At what point do you put the amniotic membrane in? And do you worry that that the amni amniotic membrane may stop? the eye from getting the proper topical therapeutics? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Joe, and awesome for clarification out there. Um, I, you know, probably my trigger point, my Pavlovian response to that would be if the dendrite uh, is on the, the visual axis. So going back to the herpes lecture, we know that herpes simplex and the herpes viruses are the leading cause of cornea vision loss. In the United States, not worldwide, there are third world countries talking United States. With that being said, um, anytime there's something on that visual axis, knowing that we can lose vision, uh, I'm pretty, pretty Pavlovian, low threshold of pulling off a uh, cryopreserved, and I'll tell you why as we get through the lecture, cryopreserved uh, at this time, um, would be central involvement. If we're out in the mid periphery, um, I've probably don't go that route, probably Zergan, um, or if it's in the periphery, maybe just Valtrex would be enough just to, just to do it. Um, but, and then to answer your question, would it block the absorption of the medication? It certainly would not. Um, it's not like a big tight fitting contact lens. Um, there's certainly room for the medication to absorb in. So uh, yeah, that was, that was great questions. Thanks for, thanks for asking that and help clarify. All right, so scarless fetal wound healing. This is courtesy of Dr. Harrison here. And this is, you know, this is where we started figuring out or understand more uh, about, you know, wound healing inside, in utero is much different than, uh, than adult wound healing. And here's a baby that had this, you know, giant uh, massive um, lesion on its neck and then on his neck and, uh, you know, they went in and did surgery and in utero surgery at 26 weeks. And they, you know, basically said to the parents, hey, everything went great. Everything's awesome. You know, but, uh, you know, it was a big tumor. And, you know, when the baby's born, don't be shocked about the, the scar. And, you know, three months later, you see this, you know, healthy baby boy. And, uh, you know, you don't really see any scar going on where this, you know, this massive tumor was, you know, and there's a lot of healing uh, um potential. And you're going to hear me mention a few things out there. And remember these, this pentraxin-3 and heavy chain hyaluronic acid. Um, you write those down. Those are pretty important as you do your research and you want to pick which amniotic membrane uh, is for your practice and for your conditions that you're using. You know, this is just showing again the power of amniotic tissue. This is a patient with diabetes, obviously with some uh, foot ulcers and uh, able to close, you know, a foot ulcer uh, in, a, in about 10 weeks. So uh, pretty, pretty powerful uh, tissue here uh, when, you know, used again in a complementary or integrative way, which now leads me, oh, I see we were still sharing that poll and we'll go to this one and leads me to polling question number two. 
you know, again, it'd be neat to see here again. I've used an amniotic membrane in the past 12 months. Yes and no. Uh, um, or, you know, if you want to make it that you've ever used one, that's fine. Um, just kind of curious to see how many have used an amniotic membrane. And if so, cryopreserved, dehydrated, or both. All right, Joe, anything? And uh, we're kind of up to cruising altitude. Anything in the chat box? So there is that. I have someone here. Did you get the handouts, Joe? Where I got a little private I, I ha message. I, ha I have them. I will launch them uh, just when you, when you pick up again. Perfect. Okay, great. It's just someone would appreciate the handouts. Mm -hmm. uh, that came to me privately. That's, I'm not sure if you get the private ones or not. Uh, good. All right, I used to do about 20 membranes a year. That's great, thank you. All right, so we've got a lot of information. I'm gonna pull the trigger on this polling question and end it. And we think we got the trend here. I'll share the results. And I see one of the handouts in there. I do two, I do the six slides per page and I also do the full slides. I'm doing, um, both, I'm doing both for you. Perfect, thank you. Um, so we have 32%, a third using amniotic membranes here, and we have uh, a nice mix, most using cryopreserved, a few doing dehydrated, and oops, the majority are using both. All right, so let me go down and move on. So adult wound healing, our body uh, does not activate the state-of-the-art healing process on its own. You know, prolonged inflammation, you can end up in the cornea with haze, scar formation, alterations going on. So really there's two paths here. You know, you have this damage, like a chemical burn, you can intervene with an amniotic membrane. And what you wanna try and do is pr promote scarless healing and clear vision, where on this side, you, inflammation, keratocyte activation, fibroblasts, remember that you know, the, 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 the traditional pathway and potentially, uh, if not controlled properly, scar formation, impaired vision, so on and so forth. So really anytime the cornea is involved and especially as we get closer to the visual axis, you know, the threshold for amniotic integrative ways of treatment uh, start to, uh, to increase for me. Now, ocular surface disease and challenges that are out there, you know, I just kind of, these are the Ds that, uh, that we're aware of, defects, delay, dystrophies, degeneration, damage, um, neurotrophic uh, persistent epithelial defects. Um, you know, before Oxervate came out, um, this is, you know, kind of the, the mainstay of how I would treat these. You can see a nice big lesion here that's in A and C, you can see how it stains. And then in B and D, you can see the usage uh, of an amniotic membrane. Now, Oxervate, we're going to talk about it a little bit later here, but it still takes about three or four weeks uh, to come in by the time you go through the process of uh, getting it approved. And, um, you know, an amniotic membrane is kind of a nice way to start teeing up this cornea uh, to, be, to be healed. So neurotrophic uh, persistent epithelial defects have become you know, with between uh, a biologic agent, again, of uh, uh, center German and, uh, and uh, or Oxervate and uh, using an amniotic membrane, uh, it's kind of been nice uh, to tackle these. Infectious keratitis, corneal ulcers with a hypopion. Again, you can see this nice little central defect, hypopion, nice red hot eye. And Joe, this is one, you know, would I start on this day? Absolutely. You know, moving to that fourth generation for quinolone. Um, you know, there was some thought back in the day that this had so much pain suppression that, you know, maybe it would confuse whether the eye is healing or not. But uh, now I think most people just day one, because of the amount of, of uh, healing that you get from the amniotic membrane, put it on day one and then use your you know, your antibiotics and, you know, it'll go right under the membrane uh, and you can get a really nice improvement in safety. And here's that herpes simplex. You know, a lot of the times what happens if you don't work with your local pharmacist, um, you know, one of the things I try and keep in stock with my local pharmacist, he's awesome. He keeps me 1% atropine and he'll keep me Zergan uh, in stock. And you can see here, you can see this dendrite, long dendrite with a little bit of a 
adjacent dendrite has, you know, right on the central pupil, this would be your central axis right over the pupil. This would be someone I would certainly not have a problem, you know, checking the insurance, checking with the patient and putting a, uh, an amniotic membrane on here while going orals and even topicals uh, on this patient to try and minimize the amount of scarring that can happen. Filamentary keratitis, they work great. You know, I hear people just say, you know, you can put a bandage contact lens over this um, and you can, and the next day those filaments will be gone. You don't even have to remove them. Uh, just put the bandage contact lens over but you're really not getting to kind of that root cause, you know, of that, of the, you know, the keratitis, the inflammation, not resetting it back. Um, so I really find in these filamentary keratitis, especially in some of these patients, like, you know, Sjogren's disease, I get these filaments or, you know, advanced dry eye um, that, you know, the patients just come in every six, eight months uh, and we can just make them feel uh, wonderful uh, and, uh, and you can see a nice healthy looking cornea until, you know, maybe the inflammation starts to kick back in recurrent corneal erosion. I'm going to jinx myself one of these times. Um, I'm about uh, 25 or 25. We're not having to send them for a PTK. Um, you can see here, here's the Wexel sponge. I kind of have it tilted the wrong way, maybe for the photo here, but I think you can get the, but you know, you can debride the cornea, put the amniotic membrane on. And it really, really helps with, uh, with um, you know, the reoccurrence. I hope these videos work here. And uh, the one I'm going to show you in this video here, and I'm going to hit play uh, here in a second because it's a little bit of a lag. But this is a patient going for PRK, photorefract uh, photorefractive keratectomy. And uh, what we're seeing here is the surgeon's going to start scraping. And you're going to see as the surgeon scrapes, Watch the cornea indent. Look how much pressure the surgeon puts on this cornea um, as, you know, as he's scraping away to try and get down to the epithelium. You can see that cornea indenting. You know, I haven't really counted, but we're probably up to 20 scrapes here and a lot of pushing. And we see what type of uh, you know, trauma and uh, the type of abrasion we have here. Now, over here, this is a patient, this is before, I have had this video now for quite a while, but I love this video because this shows us really the, the, the root cause of epithelial basement membrane or, or the outcome of what epithelial basement membrane does um, and why when that eyelid or you go to sleep at night and you put that eyelid up against that diseased epithelial basement membrane or that diseased epithelium. The epithelium is not diseased, but the basement membrane, which is down below, you can see why this basically tears open uh, super, super easy. So you can see here that I showed you before the surgeon, how hard uh, he had to push. Now here's a patient with just bad EBMD, and you can see ever so gentle grabbing the edges. And this is what happened to me the first time I had someone come in with a recurrent corneal erosion or the second time, you know, I said, oh, I'll just clean up the epithelium here. Let me just, you know, take this Wexal sponge, clean up this epithelium. And basically, even with a Wexal sponge was able to remove this epithelium like happens here. Um, and you can just see how easy it comes off. Um, and that's pretty much what I try to do when a recurrent corneal erosion comes into the practice. Now, um, a lot of times the docs in the practice will, you know, will know and they'll say, Hey, you know, we've had some treatment failures and uh, would you mind doing a pro care? And I said, yeah, I don't mind doing that. I just say to the patient, look, you're all healed up now. I don't really want to go in and abrade you, but I'll tell you the next time that you tear open, let's bring you down. We'll clean up the edges and see how big it gets. Maybe it gets this big, a limbus to limbus. And then we'll put that pro care on. So they're all teed up. You know, we get checked with the insurance company. We let the patient know uh, how much they have to pay for it. Um, and so we're all really set and really, really good success. And I can tell you that um, I really haven't had uh, to use maybe on those 25 that I was telling you about, um, maybe two or three at most that I had to do a second amniotic membrane. But that really, really shows the, the disease process of that uh, anterior basement membrane dystrophy. 
Joe, any comments out there? I know you, you know, you, you know, in your practice, you got a corneal specialist and maybe see, you know, uh, quite a amount of this. Any, any comments? Uh, no, in fact, uh, we, you know, we in the primary care level in optometry, we, we do a lot, we, you know, we do the amniotic membranes uh, as often as the, uh, as a coronal surgeon will. What I actually find kind of interesting is after an SK uh, for an EBMD, they'll put a bandage contact lens on, but generally not speaking, they don't put a, a, uh, an amniotic membrane on. What are your thoughts on that, Greg? After which surgery? After a superficial keratectomy. Yeah. Um, you know, sometimes what we do in a sense, the same kind of discussion, uh, you know, PRK, superficial keratectomies, you know, I try and get uh, an amniotic membrane on there to promote that healing. So, you know, it just, it, it really helps the, again, it's complimentary. Um, so yeah, uh, I don't have a, a surgeon that I work with now that does that, but if we did, I would encourage uh, an amniotic membrane for yeah, sure. Usually, yeah. yeah, usually they come back with uh, with a uh, bandage contact lens and that'll be on for about uh, five five to seven days. Greg, you, you, men, you mentioned insurance, checking with insurance. I don't know if you're going to cover this later, if this is appropriate, but do you want, do you want to you know, discuss like the cost of the membrane and the, the, you know, the, the insurance coverage? Yeah, uh, we can do that now. Um, yeah, the reason uh, that I just checked the coverage is because I don't know what the, the practice charge is, whether it's 1700 or 1750. But you know, the national average, I think to get these covered is around 1500, maybe 1300. I haven't seen it in a while, the, the, the reimbursement. Um, but you know, there's a lot of people out there with large deductibles, there's sometimes they have a $30 deductible. I really don't have that changed my mind. I've had people pay, you know, 1700 because they've had a $5,000 deductible. And they've said, you know, hey, I'm going to spend it one way or the other. Might as well just get a portion of it out here at your office, doc. Um, so I just, you know, want them just to be aware of, of, of what, and I don't like, oh, sorry, it's not covered. Maybe I'll go somewhere else. You know, I don't spend their money. I just make them aware. They know what they did with their insurance. So um, I, I, you know, I could look it up online and see what the at, na, national average is, but it's going to be different. I know in Philadelphia, uh, uh, which is, you know, just a few hours away from me, you know, it's a little bit higher reimbursement than I get out here in uh, this in central Pennsylvania. Um, but uh, that's the reason why I discuss it with the patient. The you know, here's Salzman nodule de degeneration. Obviously, this is being done in the operating room. Uh, and then the, we do, my surgeon does do Salzman nodule re, re, uh, removal. And part of his protocol is we get to put the amniotic membrane on uh, at the office. So uh, you can see here, this is a patient that, that we did that for. Uh, chemical burns, you know, it's another good usage of when to maybe intervene with a uh, you know, some type of uh, amniotic membrane to steer away from that uh, corneal damage. And you can see here, we have a patient that, uh, you know, over the course of, you know, 17 days healed nicely. And you can see here, you know, pretty much in a scarless uh, type of way, at least on that central uh, visual axis. Um, I have a lot of stem cell burnout uh, that comes into the practice, um, probably because, you know, they've been you know, a couple different places and they can't really figure out why they wear their contacts and then their eye gets red and inflamed and they can't wear, it. they become contact lens intolerant. It's really not GPC. And I've always tried to explain, you know, uh, the, the, Hey, do you know, those little wispy clouds. And finally it was wherever this was, I ran outside, saw all these wispy clouds. And these is the wisp. This, this, this right here is the wispy part of the cloud that I'm talking about is you know, kind of, you know, kind of the you know, wispiness to that. Why am I talking that is because that's what stem cell burnout looks like. And if you remember out here at the limbus where the limbal cells get damaged or limbal cell exhaustion, stem cell uh, exhaustion, uh, the limbal cells uh, get damaged. And what they do is they produce just bad epithelium. And this is an okay picture that, that I'm trying to show this with, but you can see here that's, you know, it's a little bit of injection. It's not really that red, but it's usually that, you know, that monthly lens that uses multi-purpose 
and you know it might be a little higher of a prescription, a little bit higher of a myo. So you've got the oxygen issue, you got the mechanical issue, you got the crushing issue, you have the multi-purpose disinfectant, which I always tell the patient is nothing more than a fancy name for Clorox because it kills bacteria, fungus, and parasites, but absorbs into the contact lens. So it's a multifactorial oxygen deprivation, mechanical, you know, poison with you know, chemicals, and it kills the uh, limbal cells or, uh, or at least decreases their function. And you get this type of pattern. Now, this is amiodarone, and I love looking at amiodarone. And this is a great picture here because I kind of use it as a tracer cell, which you can kind of now see how the epithelium heals. And uh, that's why you kind of get this vertex whirl um, by a patient using uh, this medication, getting out phospholipidosis, and it's tracking in. You can kind of see the pattern of the, of the cornea, which now you can see when I use staining on this eye or sodium fluorescein, and you can see that the damage is here along that limbal area. And you can kind of see over here, at least the top part of this cornea is just producing bad epithelium. And that's that limbal cell exhaustion or stem cell ex expansion. So I usually get these, I get them in the practice and I say to the patient, hey, look, you know, it's, it's not such a terrible condition because the good news is your stem cells will slowly replace over time. You just can't wear a contact lens for a year. And you know, the reaction you get with that, right? Like, wow, a year, what the doc, what's going on? Um, you know, I'm a higher myo, but I don't really want to wear my glasses. And I say, well, that's a year if we don't do anything. We can speed this up by, you know, using things like steroids and um, maybe getting some, you know, some fish oils and some other kind of natural ways going on there and got some steroids. But I said, we can really accelerate this by using uh, an amniotic membrane and replacing the, the, in a sense, or helping replace this limbal cell and maybe get you down to maybe a three month type of, of situation. So, you know, the, the, the issue is, you know, they come out of their lenses, they use maybe Maxitrol for a few weeks and all of a sudden their eye feels great and the cornea heals up and then they go back in because we're really not fixing this uh, limbal cell area. Hey, Greg, so, be Greg, before you go too far, because we talked yeah. about coronal burns, and chemical keratitis, and the question just came in, what about amniotic membranes on chemical burns immediately, like day one? Are you gonna do it day one? Yeah, um, really, I don't really have any issue introducing the amniotic membrane, it's the day of those traumas, uh, mm -hmm. um, to really slow down and in a natural way, right? We're not using steroids and inhibiting we're using a naturopathic way here of, of healing that would occur in that, in that, uh, in utero, in that fetus. So I used to be like, Oh, I'm going to wait a couple of days and see if I get reversal. And just like anything, when you start getting comfortable and lecturing on it and doing some digging, like why would I not intervene on day one? So yeah, that's a great question of, um, yeah, chemical burn, acid, uh, alkaline day one, sure. Get it on there. And, you know, start that kind of um, passive, um, um, or I mean, the alternative uh, pathway of, of healing here. So uh, yeah, that's a great question. Anything else? No, nope, you're good. You're all caught up. All right. So the, uh, the ocular surface disorders, you know, I kind of mentioned a few, but uh, you know, any persistent non-healing defect that could be in a sense, neurotrophic underlying cause or other issues. We talked about the erosions and ulcers and, you know, dry eye. That's another great place, um, you know, steering away from a lot of the chemicals. I work uh, down the road uh, from a six man uh, doctor uh, rheumatology practice. I do a lot of their uh, eye. That's about the FDA in, uh, investigations. I've done some on my own, but I'm usually uh, right now we're doing two Sjogren's. Uh, one is a biologic for them. And I'm not real quite sure what the other medication is that they're using, but I do their eye findings, do their staining, report any side effects back uh, for them um, uh, that's out there. But I see a lot of dry eye. And so treating the Sjogren's and then moving up to the moderate dry eye and even the early dry eye 
uh, helping the patients out with amniotic membranes is, you know, just kind of, as you get comfortable, you start with the train wrecks and then you kind of move up to things that like, wow, maybe if I intervene now, they won't get to step three. I can intervene at step one. So you just kind of learn uh, where to, to do that after you get more comfort. And again, the neurotrophic and the acute and uh, thermal thermal burns. I have curling iron burns that come in quite a bit. Um, I'm not sure if I do it on welders, flash. Those usually go away pretty quickly. Uh, chemical burns for sure. And the list goes on there, as you can see. I'm not going to read that whole list to you. Um, that leads me to calling, polling question number three. I got it there, Joe. You have it okay. there. Sorry. All right. So I consider cryopreserved prokara and dehydrated membranes to be the same when treating an ocular condition. Uh, yes, no, and threw in the option on this one, Joe, as people like, not sure, and that's why I'm here. Oh, I see the question now. Yep, chemical burn immediately day one as well. Absolutely, yep. Yeah, it's kind of funny. I've been doing amniotic membranes for quite a few years. And um, I don't know, it was maybe two or three years ago that I realized that it, you know, I was thinking of more of a, you know, more of traditional medicine, right? They use it in surgery, so on and so forth. But as I kept taking more, you know, integrative and naturopathic courses that are out there and come going to conferences, I'm like, duh, this, I'm doing integrative medicine here. This is kind of cool. So uh, I didn't know I was doing it until I knew it. So. And I think that, you know, when people realize or recognize how hard some herpetic diseases can be to, uh, to get the patient past, not, you know, not just the initial infection, but the lingering uh, adverse effects afterwards. And this, this really makes a lot of sense, certainly herpetic disease. Yep. Yep. Perfect. Yeah. Great comment. So we can see here, um, you know, we have 14% saying yes, they're about the same. We have 41% saying no. And then we have the majority saying, hey, I'm really not sure. You know, you know, that's why I'm here. And that's why we continue to hold uh, education in, in a variety of topics here. So, you know, we'll go through this and right off the bat here, suture list amniotic membranes. There's two major categories, cryopreserved and, and dehydrated. Um, and they're termed two different, uh, two different types of um, nomenclature. One is wound healing, and that's cryopreserved, and dehydrated is wound covering. And I believe that's the, uh, you know, the medic or the FDA that has come down uh, with that nomenclature, um, that if you go to, uh, to how it's approved, um, then you can see one is wound healing, and there's really one in that in that category with you know a laundry list there of uh, of the wound covering, and there might be some newer ones out there um, that, that I'm missing, but it's not really on purpose. It's just to kind of show the the difference of the two categories: cryo preserved uh, and dehydrated. And you know, dehydrated is different. Um, you know, if you if you if you talk to a lot of docs, there's Definitely usage for them, but you're going to see that when I get to a certain specific area, you're going to like the uh, uh, in the cornea, you're going to want to maybe steer away or just kind of rethink your approach. And again, that's why we're here tonight. And uh, dehydrated, uh, preserved using a vacuum, low temperature heat. You know, there's different approaches here. This is kind of a broad path because there's a bunch in this. Some use really low heat and not destroy certain things and so on and so forth, but uh, it's to retain the uh, devitalized cellular components. Um, the FDA approved uh, the claims for this type of amniotic are limited to wound uh, coverage. Again, not wound healing uh, that's out there. They're kept at room temperature. That always seems to kind of be like a, uh, a, a tries to be a selling event. Uh, or, or a reason to use it kept at room temperature. You don't need to be a freezer and then, you know, must be rehydrated uh, for, for use. You remove the disc carefully from the package. You place, you know, some prepare cane onto there. You know, some have uh, watermarks to make sure that you are getting the amnion onto the cornea. And, you know, one of them has IOP as a watermark so that you can see it's IOP and that's the way it should read once it's on the eye. Um, you smooth the graft over, you can use a Wexel sponge, 
Uh, you can sterile saline and then put a bandage contact lens on. Again, you know, cheaper cost, lower cost. Um, you know, you do lose a few things in that dehydrating uh, process. And so these would be good for, you know, pterygium surgeries and conjunctival replacement. Again, uh, no freezer needed uh, out there. Uh, and another, another way to use it, another reason would be in the cryopreserved is, uh, it, I kind of think of it as, as it's not really frozen. It's in this antifreeze of glycol and amphotericin B and Cipro. So if the patient is allergic to amphotericin B or Cipro, you really don't want to put it on the eye and cause a problem. That would be another indication for dehydrated. It could require a lid speculum, Wexel sponge bandage contact lens uh, to place onto the eye. Cryopreserved, again, a different type of amniotic membrane uh, in a sense in the way it is uh, uh, stored and created. Um, there's uh, a double uh, strength in a sense, and then there's the uh, single, uh, so the mild to moderate they're showing here. Um, and the difference really between is the polycarbonate ring and in the severe, it would just be a double amniotic membrane. And again, here's dehydrated uh, out there. And again, here's the forceps showing the IOP, which now the, the amnion would be away from us uh, towards the back of the screen there. Now, a lot of people want to know how safe they are, you know, and, you know, how do these companies go about getting the, this tissue? Do they you know, kind of have people like Joe and I standing at a hospital. Hey, I'll give you, you know, 25 bucks for your placenta. It looks like you're going in for a, uh, you know, it looks like you're going to have a baby tonight, man. You want to make a quick 50 bucks tonight if I snag that placenta from you? That's not really how it works. Um, these are people going in for planned C-sections. Blood specimen draws are taken, you know, seven days before, seven days after. There's FDA and CMS guidelines checking for HIV and hepatitis. And you can see the laundry list of, 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 of viruses, bacteria looking for anaerobic, aerobic, looking for fungus that's out there. So again, very well regulated, very safe types of procedures here uh, when it comes to uh, using these membranes. Now the you know, amniotic- You know, oh, you know, yeah, you know Greg, Greg, your description, like you and I standing out there you know, trying to solicit membranes would never happen because I have learned never to initiate a conversation about a woman being pregnant. All never. right. Never? Never. <coughs> yeah, I'll check that one. All right. So amniotic membrane components, you know, here's a whole bunch of, <laughs> you got a nice comment in the uh, chat box on that one, Joe. Um, you got uh, amniotic membrane components here, proteoglycans, growth factors, collagens, fibrolectin. But really, I want to point out here, heavy chain hyaluronic acid and this Pentrax in three. Write that down, screenshot it, whatever. Look, keep it circled in the, in the handout. Those get lost in the dehydration process. And that's why, you know, when I do a lot of, you know, if you want to say heavier corneal lifting at the practice or in my, my patient care, um, really T cell su suppression, right? You're in that adaptive immune system, suppressing those T cells, inhibiting those giant cell formation, controlling MMP9, which is another enzyme that's, you know, that are all pro-inflammatory. And that's why having heavy chain as opposed to uh, low chain, uh, uh, hyaluronic acid and no Pentrax in three uh, is really uh, in a sense a game changer when coming to some of the of the uh, of the um, uh, um, decision making. And again, here is cryopreserve versus dehydrated, just kind of a, a way of uh, looking at it. And here this is a molecule of what I'm trying to show here of heavy chain and they're all connected and you can see in here, this Pentrax in three, and what happens is in a dehydrated state, this all kind of breaks down, but it's been shown that, you know, heavy chain and Pentrax in three orchestrates, you know, apoptosis, it steers away from that. It helps with the macrophages and decreasing the lymphocyte act activation and promotes uh, uh, regenerative healing. So again, you know, you can hop on the PubMed or Dr. Google and really see the importance of these two molecules when it comes to, uh, again, inhibiting that innate and adaptive uh, immune response uh, when it comes to trauma to tissue. 
And uh, so, you know, just kind of dig into that and uh, and just look at that. So cryo preserved, how do they do it? It's, a, I guess, a, uh, uh, a proprietary way of getting things to minus 80 degrees Celsius without forming ice, um, minimal manipulation to the fresh amniotic membrane. And again, again, the big key area here is preserving that. A heavy chain hyaluronic acid and pentraxin three, which uh, really helps uh, in the healing process. You know, here I am just going to show you a video here um, of me putting this into uh, the patient's eye. I think I have uh, sound on this. We really don't need the sound. It's the sound coming up on a few other videos. But you're going to see here. The key is is that the amniotic membrane is here. My technician has already rinsed it. The key is rinse, 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 get all that glycol, amphotericin B as much as you can off because it will sting. So you'll see here that, and I do speed up the video at times. It's not that I'm really nervous or anything. So this right here. Taking that off. I do get yelled at because now I'm contaminating the membrane, but uh, um, you could be probably wearing a pair of gloves here. And watch, I'm going to pause right here because I'm going to kind of just kind of tell you what I'm going to do here. And watch as you put a bunch of these in. I have the patient's head in the headrest there. Uh, you have the patient look down and then you'll see with my thumb there, I'll pull up and get that fornix and literally I'll lift it up kind of in a sense, lack of a better way, kind of jam it up in that fornix. And as I feel it go up into the fornix, you just kind of, I'll let go and I'll just say to the patient, okay, look up. And it just kind of sucks the, 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 uh, the amniotic membrane in. And it's kind of neat. We'll do these, Joe and I at our meetings, live meetings, we'll do these uh, um, uh, workshops. And we have optometrists that are, you know, using sclerals and widening the eye and jamming this up and the, the uh, using RGPs and contact lenses, but then you give them like this amniotic membrane, which was, you know, a baby at one point or part of a baby uh, uh, or a part of the fetus, not really part of the baby, but part of the fetus. And, uh, and in like, they, it's like, oh my gosh, what do I do here? It's like, come on, it's just like a contact lens. And think about it, that baby was in there kicking. If you ever try and pop that with your finger, that's pretty, uh, pretty, uh, pretty tight, uh, pretty tough tissue for just being a few microns thin. But watch what happens here. I'm going to okay. right into the fornix. I right there, pop, look up. look up, and then just pull the lid down. Okay. Literally that easy. Hey, Greg, for people who may not be comfortable or, or accustomed to using this, is there an inside or outside? There's a it? right side, yeah. inside. Oops. Um, yes, Joe, there is. Great, great point. Uh, uh, for this one here, it's pretty straightforward. Um, because it's like a bottle cap, like a crown. You'll know if you have the wrong way um, because obviously it'll be sticking out. But yes, there's, you can see there, I'm kind of grabbing the ridge. It's upside down right now. I'm flipping it over. And it's kind of like a bottle cap or like a Tupperware lid. Uh, you try to put a Tupperware lid on. You can see it's facing down right there and slide it in. So yes, uh, if it put it in upside down, then it would be like a bottle cap that would be upside down. So, yep, good point. This is called a tape tarsography. Literally, I like using this microsport tape. It tears real easy, a couple millimeters wide. Um, I basically put two pieces of tape on top of each other. And all we're doing with this is just trying to control the blink uh, it stops the membrane from eroding so quickly. Um, it helps with comfort. It helps its center. You're going to see, look down. I put it right on the lid crease and it's going to create almost in a sense of tosis. Tell the patient to shower with that. Um, if it falls off, that's okay. Now you'll see here that, uh, uh, I'll eventually take this off in the, in the video. Look up. And I just use some type of golf club spud. Just grab the edge here. And you'll see that it just slides right off and uh, he's done. You'll see here, this is what he looked like before. He had all this persistent SPK, uh, maybe toxic, uh, the way as much that was being dumped onto that eye with all the chemicals. And that's it after. Now, this is, I'll uh, pause it real quick, is this is, oh, I screwed that up again. Let's go way over here. There we go. Let's see if I can do that. You can see that's before. And then we'll transition to here after. And you'll see that 
this is just mucus. This isn't staining. This looks great. And, you know, a lot of people ask how long to leave the uh, uh, membrane on. You, you need about five days. If you can get three days, my analogy that I use when I get that question is it's kind of like bubble gum. You put bubble gum in in the morning or, you know, put bubble gum in like at seven o'clock full of flavor, you know, spearmint just bursting throughout, you know, and then about, you know, two or three hours later, yeah, you could tell it's spearmint, but it certainly doesn't have the flavor that it did when you first put it in. And those biologics are the same way. You really minimum of three days. If you can get it on there for three days, you've got a download, you got all those healing properties downloaded into the eye. Five days, is awesome. You know, day six, day seven, it's not like you keep amping up, you know, you get that diminishing returns in a sense. It's not bad for it to be on there, but you're really not getting that amount of, of biologics. So minimum three, sweet spot is five uh, to really get those biologics. Uh, Greg, um, some do, you, doc, Greg, do, you, do you feel it necessary to use that tape torsorophy? Um, not always. If, you know, if I'm trying to you know, minimize the erosion, or if I think the patient's going to be in some pain, it just kind of helps out. So I don't really have to uh, on that. So uh, for those patients. Okay. The only reason I'm saying is I, I had a patient where I did use it mm -hmm. and he had an allergic reaction to the tape and he came in, but almost looked like a, a horrible cellulitis just from the, from allergic reaction to the tape. Oh, yep. Yeah. You gotta be careful with tape, right? You can have a reaction with that. Um, so Joe, as a side question here, will we have a workshop at the Florida meeting? That's something we can consider that came to me privately. So, um, and Greg, and there's another could, I'm sorry, there's another question in the chat. I, I really couldn't, uh, I really couldn't, the, the, the abbreviations kind of got me. Do you mind taking a look at it? What's the use in, what's the okay. use in oh, glaucoma patient on two different drops uh, per day? moderate SPK, how long, intermediate therapy, so on and so forth. So yeah, Peter, that's a great uh, question. Um, I've certainly had uh, patients, we know that that BAK, those glaucoma drops, the, the most compliant patients out there, they're the ones that get abused and, and with their, in their corneas and the keratitis. So I use amniotic membranes with the glaucoma patients to help reset their surface. That's a great point out. The only time you wouldn't, would not want to do it if you had a patient, I had one in today, a patient with pseudo exfoliation that had a, uh, a, a, a trap done, uh, a trap shunt, and uh, my glaucoma surgeon would probably not be pleased if I decided to put a amniotic membrane on there and scar down that, that trap. So um, great, uh, great comment there. Heavy SPK, glaucoma patient, lots of drops, toxic keratitis. Uh, great usage out there. Yep, definitely use it on those patients. Uh, consent form. Some people say it's a minor procedure. Here's a consent form, an example. We use it at the office since it is uh, a kind of, uh, in a sense, a minor procedure. It's right here, 65778. We check it, patient's name, who's putting it in, all the different modifiers. There's zero uh, uh, post-op days on this. Used to be a 10-day, now it's zero. Um, Procara, make some notes, have it signed off, and we just scan it in their, their electronic health record. We talked about the tape tarsorophy. Uh, here's the coding out here. Um, this is a while back, but it looks like I maybe did this in Michigan, showing uh, the uh, $1,400 in Detroit and the $1,330 there in the rest of Michigan. And again, really the point of this is uh, you can look this code up uh, and really important, it's a zero day post-op. Contraindications, again, with cryopreserved, it would be uh, uh, Cipro or Amphotericin B. Careful with those eyes. Here we go with those drainage devices and filtering blebs. Incomplete blink might cause them to pop out. So intervene, uh, faster re-epithelialization, you know, intervention against the scar formation uh, that's out there. So polling question number four here is... Um, would you use a dehydrated amniotic membrane to help treat an infectious keratitis? Yes, no, not sure. So we have a case here that they got these herpes simplex down there. We've got this central corneal, looks like infectious ulcer. We got a nice hypopion. Um, yes, no, dehydrated, that's out there. 
I think, Greg, we're all caught up on the questions. All right, so we're going to, looks like we got a good audience here tonight. So I'm just gonna end the poll. Good, nice being interactive and share the results and just move down here. And uh, yes would be 35%, no 44 and 20% not sure. And the reason why I bring this up is you can decide what you wanna do in your office, but uh, I, you know, I fly on airplanes and I like to read package inserts. See, that's kind of geeky of me, but uh, I got this one as a trade show one time and grabbed the package insert and said, can I have that? Sure, absolutely. And as I was reading uh, the package insert, you know, it says down here, um, talks right here, it's wound covering, it's indicated for wound covering. And then it says here, um, and the risk of complications by D should not be used, or I'll just say dehydrated, don't want to pick on any company, dehydrated should not be used in the presence of active infection. So, you know, makes no claims of biologic properties of this allograph. So right there in the package insert, you know, it says, you know, it's, don't use in the presence of an infectious keratitis. So, you know, I know Joe does uh, defense work. He does a little bit more or a lot more than I do. Um, I do get called upon for defense work. And, you know, there's things that do pop up from time to time. I'm not sure how, how much someone would pull out a package insert, but it'd be kind of hard to say, well, you know, yeah, that's on there, but it's probably safe to use. So just, you just want to make people aware. Cryopreserved in a sense, it's intended for eyes with ocular surface damage and flame scarring. You know, it is wound covering. So uh, I'm sorry, wound healing, not wound covering, wound healing. And in a sense, it's indicated for an infection uh, on the eye. And you can see here that, you know, they, there's always this, oh, you know, ours are dehydrated and you can have a three-year shelf life. Well, this one has a two-year shelf life. And if you're spending money on these, I'm hopefully that they're not sitting on the shelf for longer than, you know, a few months rather than two years to three months. So they both work really, really well. As I transition into the uh, uh, pharmacological, I just, you know, thought this was kind of neat that transitioning into, you know, we have uh, Oxervate, which is a biologic that is helps with the corneal nerves. And here was, you know, corneal nerve regeneration in a, in a sense, a naturopathic way. And that's why I think it's a nice little segue to while you're waiting for Oxervate. And you can see there's persistent SPK. And you can read all this down through here, but it basically says one uh, cryopreserved, you know, healed this. But under the electron microscope, you can see that there were a decrease in the corneal nerves in A. And as time went by, you got that increase in corneal nerves. So I really like the approach of that kind of complementary, integrative, naturopathic, and then moving into sub biologic that we'll be talking about. So I'm going to kind of transition now into kind of allopathic biologic approach, the biologic pharmaceuticals that are, are for the eye. And just want to review biologics. I'm not going to get really in depth as when we do a biologic course, but I think it's worth talking about that biologic therapies include a wide range of medical products. It started with vaccines. Um, and blood products. Insulin was one, probably one of the first biologics that were out there. And now today, when people talk about biologics, they're usually talking about the second generation, moving into Humira and Remicade. And, you know, those are some big boy biologics. You know, they, they get in there and really suppress the immune system at a very high level uh, and, you know, that's why you got to watch out for people with tuberculosis and, and so on and so forth. And what's happening is these next generation, and again, maybe the third or the next new generation of biologics that we're going to be talking about, like Oxervate and Tepeza, instead of being maybe like immune suppressive, they're more immunomodulary because we're really getting in and targeting some of these receptors that are upregulated rather than hitting that immune system at a high level. So that's what biologics are. Biologics uh, are the opposite of small molecule drugs. They're huge. And that's the reason why most of them need to be an injection or infused because you just can't get it into the uh, size of a pill. You have to, they're so big. And, 
and they're usually very, very delicate, right? That's why like the, uh, the COVID vaccine, it was frozen at, uh, you know, that very, it was shipped at that very cold uh, uh, degrees because it kept it frozen and locked up because if you would try and ship it in its natural state, it's kind of like a ball of yarn or a, 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 if you lay yarn down and you try and carry it, uh, you'd rather maybe like throw some water on it and freeze it. And then before using it, let it thaw out and then inject it in a sense. So biologics are usually very delicate. They're large in size. Uh, like aspirin is like composed of uh, 20 to 100 atoms, as opposed to biologics being up to uh, as small as 5,000, as big as 50,000 atoms that are out there. And uh, again, here's just a picture here of using aspirin, using the measurement here of Dalton's because it's so small, 180 Dalton's moving over into insulin being a 5,800 or 51 amino acids. But jumping down to IgG and how big and how, how convoluted and all the amino acids and how they twist up to form that IgG. So again, very big uh, uh, molecules uh, that are out there. And again, it, just stressing upon, you can see here that uh, uh, an aspirin would be like a bike to a uh, human growth hormone would be like a car to something like an IgG antibody uh, is complex and is large in a sense, in both ways complex and large uh, as a jet engine that's out there. So now you can really understand why some of these just costs just through the roof uh, that are out there because they are very complex. So when it comes to producing a biologic, I, oop, I guess stop sharing here and let's jump to number five. This is a two-part question in a sense. Biologics are produced by inserting DNA or the DNA sequence into yeast, bacteria, viruses, all the above. Not sure. That's why I'm here. And I think we got it down here, but on B here, we have biologic pharmaceuticals are very small or very large. We kind of talked about that, but it's just a way to reinforce it. Anything roll in here, Joe? Yeah, there's a couple of things I think are really good questions. Do you charge an office visit when a patient comes in to have an amniotic membrane removed or do you consider removal included in the initial fee? Yeah, that is a great question. Um, with the zero uh, uh, global fee, um, you know, let's say they have an infectious ulcer. I put the amniotic membrane on that day. Yeah, I might have to see them the next day. Um, that's an office visit uh, and everything after that. Um, removal, that's tricky um, because I kind of do it both ways. Uh, I, when I put these on, I usually give the patient my cell phone number and say, okay, your vision is very blurry. Look out there. Yeah, I can hardly see the big E. I can see maybe the SL 2200. Good. When your vision goes clear, give me a call on my cell phone or call the office and because I usually have them set up like let's say I'm doing a dry eye and uh, something that doesn't need to be followed like an infectious ulcer uh, like a Sjogren's patient or something like hey this is going to dissolve probably I'll see you next week um, I'm only working Monday Tuesday Wednesday they might call me on Friday it might be someone at the office I'll just say look can you just take the ring off they already have an appointment uh, in that case I would you know if I run in I unlock the office I take them back take the ring off everything looks okay boom, let them go. So it kind of goes both ways, but most of the time, if I'm following something, they're getting changed, getting charged. Yeah, I, I would, you know, Greg, I, I would suggest in that you're, you're not really just taking off a, a, the ring or taking off the membrane, you're assessing how well it works. So I think that would be uh, definitely a follow-up. Can you mention your thoughts on Regenerize? I believe they classified their drop as a biologic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I just started using uh, Regenerize in the last, uh, ooh, um, six to eight weeks, maybe two to three months, and uh, really getting my mind wrapped around it. It truly is. It falls into integrative uh, medicine, uh, complementary medicine. It's a biologic, a natural biologic. It's an acellular component. Uh, they have Regenerize Light, Regenerize Pro. Um, 
certainly could put it into this lecture and uh, would probably run out of time getting through the rest of the biologics. And that was the only reason why I didn't put it in there. But Sheila, thank you for bringing it up. And it's kind of in between there, you know, it might not be as maybe say robust as a, uh, as a uh, uh, amniotic membrane for an infectious ulcer. Um, but, you know, I have used uh, patients to reset their Sjogren's recently uh, with an amniotic membrane, and maybe I won't have to use the cryopreserved as I'm starting to now move into um, the pro and into the light usage. But uh, um, got some good video the other day on my phone about a patient that was very pleased uh, with her uh, outcome of the Regenerai. So stay tuned, then uh, I'll probably have some uh, CE out there at some point and how to use it clinically in the practice or where I found it useful. So that was a great question. So do you use Procare for an active ulcer, but not a dehydrated form? George, that is exactly the way I do it in the practice, just because of the way the package inserts are. Um, if that, if it's an infectious ulcer, herpes simplex, and those ones that I was showing you, I typically go to cryopreserve in a sense that it is, um, in a sense, indicated, and there's nothing on the package inserts that says it's contraindicated. And those are the reasons why um, you, you, you know, you can decide how, you know, or everyone listening can decide how they want to do it in their practice. Again, not showing superiority bias, just trying to point out things that are on package inserts. So. All right, so let me end that poll. Uh, let me read the results here. Biologics are produced by, oh, you guys can't see it. I got to end it and then share it. Uh, yeast, bacteria, virus, all the above. So the 39%, so the people that said uh, yeast, that is correct, but they also use bacteria, also use viruses. So all the above and uh, the 17%. So now you know. Um, and then we can see here that, uh, uh, that they are very, I guess, maybe very small compared to the human body, but compared to other pharmaceuticals that are out there, they are very large. So maybe I worded that question uh, poorly. So compared to pharmaceuticals out there, they're very large, but I guess compared to the universe, they are very small. So, all right. So let's go to poll six when it's ready. And... So the making of a biologic is they found out the DNA sequence of certain things and like the COVID virus vaccine, they found out the, the DNA sequence of the COVID uh, molecule or the COVID virus, basically found the part that makes the, uh, the crown, took everything off, put it on messenger RNA, all that fun stuff, and it produces crowns and your body has an allergic reaction to it. Uh, or an immune reaction to it. And that's how a lot of these biologics are made. They find out the DNA sequence and then they put it into some bacteria, yeast or virus. And then it spits out this long chain and then they have to try and find a way to spin it into that, you know, line up all those amino acids and, and turn it into the protein or whatever they're making as we talk, out, talk about this. What I wanna point out is they have very weak chemical bonds and they're very sensitive. Uh, that's out there. So that's a biologic. A biosimilar is really not a generic. It's just another company taking the DNA sequence, plugging it into maybe a different microorganism and coming out with the same exact molecule. If it's human growth hormone, it's human growth hormone, it's human growth. It just might be a different process. So that's why they call it a, a biosimilar. It's really not a, uh, a generic medication. So you could call them highly similar when they're out there. It's really not appropriate to say uh, uh, a generic of it because it's really not generic. The uh, reference molecule, you'll hear that a lot in biologics. They're the ones that spend a lot of money. Uh, they're out there uh, you know, doing the molecular characterization, the non-clinical trials, and then it's uh, the phase three. And then when it comes to a biosimilar, you have the, uh, you know, the clinical studies being a lot smaller. The pyramids are, are flipped there uh, in a little bit. So the difference between biologic and a biosimilar uh, that's out there. So, you know, monitoring parameters of biologics, you know, they do suppress that immune system pretty well, depending on 
uh, the, the biologic, you know, the immune system doesn't, uh, I lecture with Tracy, Dr. Offerdahl, you've seen me share the stage. He always likes to use the, you know, the immune system is prissy. It doesn't like to be messed with. And uh, you're tinkering with it at different levels when you're using these biologics. And that's why you'll see a lot of these immunosuppressive, you know, if you have TB or if you have this or have that or whatever, it can cause things to, you know, get worse uh, that's out there because the big boys, Humira and Remicade, they are, uh, they can really suppress the immune system uh, that's out there. So uh, biologics uh, that are used in the ocular uh, arena. And uh, I'm going to do a, a, uh, a polling question here. And uh, polling question number six is, which biologic drug is used, has been used in eye care the longest? Is it Oxervate? Is it Tepeza, Actemera, Avastin? Are you not sure? And that's why you're here. I think you're all caught up. We're all caught up in the questions there, Greg. Perfect. Thanks, Jim. Mm -hmm. Unless you have a direct uh, direct message. Uh, that's good. I should look. Thank you. Thanks for the reminder. Nope, I don't have anything here. No, we're good. All right. So we've got uh, a great response here. The audience is responding well tonight. Thank you for making this interactive, keeping us compliant. Um, and you guys are spot on here with uh, uh, Avastin uh, being the longest uh, biologic agent that's out there. So treatment of cordial neovascular membranes going back to Avastin and then the various ones that have come up to use for retinopathy of prematurity, diabetic retinopathy, macular degeneration. I think we're all pretty much familiar, but it, you know, we're going to talk about ocular biologics. I could not leave those out. And you can see that, you know, it started maybe back in the day with Macugen and being an RNA ampter and then moving into Avastin in 2005, being a uh, humanized full length monoclonal antibody. And that's why if you look at the end here, it says MAB, that's what it stands for, monoclonal antibody. And this ZU means that it's, you know, humanized. And what that means is, is that you're less likely to, in a sense, to have a reaction to it. So it's a humanized type of antibody, as opposed to using you know, potentially uh, animal types of monoclonal or you're having animal-like parts. So you can see here that Lucentis and Ilea, um, and then we have Bayview here that that's out. So I'll stop sharing of that poll six, and we'll go to poll seven here. And which biologic is indicated for neurotrophic keratitis? Neurotrophic keratitis, is it Oxervate, Tepeza, uh, Actemera, Avastin, or you just don't know? neurotrophic keratitis. And again, the audience is on top of it. So I'm gonna end the poll, share the results. And you can see here that we have Oxervate, Center German. Now I'll talk about those four letters there that B, K, B, J, and then we have Tepeza. And you can see Actemer doesn't have those four letters and Avastin. And again, uh, I'll show that and tell you why here in a second. Let me oh, stop sharing and move on. All right. So Oxervate, Center Garmin, that BKBJ comes down to the fact now, someone has that uh, sequence, and this really isn't a immunosuppressive. This is, in a sense, a nerve growth factor. So someone found out the DNA sequence, the amino sequence, in a sense, uh, of nerve growth factor. It's out there in a library, just someone has to be able to put it into some type of organism, spit it out and twist it up and make it look like nerve growth factor. So there could be a generic, if you want to say, or a biosimilar that comes out. And then you heard me talk about working with outcome-based um, registries. 
how would you know which one it was if they were all called center German because they're all going to be called center German. So they literally arbitrarily some way, somehow the BKBJ means absolutely nothing. So when the next biologic or the biosimilar comes out, it's going to be called center German. It just will be some other four reference molecules so that they can tell if it goes into this registry that's going to do some type of analysis and try to see if there's a better outcome of one versus the other. That's why it's really there. So Oxervate is not infused or injected. It's really an eye drop, which is kind of cool. Not only is it uh, a biologic for eye care, but it's also uh, in an eye drop form. And it was approved in uh, 2018. Um, I didn't spell pharmacy wrong. It's an Italian company uh, that is out there and there's really no contraindications uh, for it. So here's a poll here. Uh, we talked about these organisms, which one do they use? Do they use uh, E. coli? Do they use a Chinese hamster ovary? Uh, do they use COVID-19? Do they use Staph aureus or you're just not sure? What are they using to produce? They have the DNA sequence. They literally, I think of it as a surrogate mother. They're plugging it in and uh, turning it into a uh, um, nerve growth factor. Not endogenous, because endogenous is what we make. All right, so I'm glad uh, to see no one was even being funny out there. That's cool. I'll share the results. I have E. coli. We have a Chinese hamster ovary, Staph aureus, and then uh, I'm not sure. And that's why we're here. So let's just find out. And here it is, E. coli. So they literally use E. coli to put that in and basically create the Oxervate. And uh, what we're working on here is just a reminder that, you know, you have to have nerves that talk and create neuromediators that create epithelial cells and uh, keratocytes and then talk to the tears. And, you know, if you get a breakdown on the, of the nerves and get neurotrophic keratitis, then that's what happens. You end up with, uh, with, uh, with a decreased corneal sensitivity. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. So I make sure that we get to Tepeza. So again, we have the pathophysiology of NK is that it's a, a loss of corneal sensitivity, uh, the corneal nerves. And man, wouldn't it be cool if someone could just come up with some type of nerve growth factor because uh, neurotrophic keratitis, in a sense, is, uh, a, is, 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 um, is the root cause is trigeminal nerve damage leading to the neurotrophic keratitis. And you can see here that there's a whole list, right? I think we're pretty familiar with you know, herpes infections and uh, infectious keratitis, but I think contact lens wear and uh, drug toxicity in a sense from contact lens solution, chronic ocular surface inflammation is, I believe it was Peter earlier talking about the glaucoma patients and getting abused in a sense with drops and BAK. And usually the most compliant patients are the ones that suffer the most, but then we have cataract surgery, cutting corneal nerves and LASIK and all these other procedures. But I also always like to focus over here on systemic diabetes. We always focus on that retinopathy, um, but we remember that we talk about fingers and toes getting neuropathy, but the eye can get neuropathy too, in a sense of decreased cornea sensitivity out there. So, you know, we always say, you know, eyes, retinopathy, neuropathy, nephropathy, the eye can actually get a lot of neuropathy from diabetes. So let's not forget about that. There's different ways of staging it. Now, obviously one is mild, a little bit more involved with two, and then you're getting into stromal involvement in three using the MACI classification that's out there. I wanna show you this video here. Uh, this is a patient that I'm gonna do cornea sensitivity on. I take a cotton tip applicator, literally pull the top off, twist it with my fingers underneath the microscope. I make sure it's a fiber. And I'm just going to play the video here and hopefully the video plays good. This eye is not desensitized. So I tell the patient, look, tell me when you feel it or you'll see them blink. It's ever so gently touch, boom, touch, boom. Now let's go over to this other eye and we come over and you can see there's something going on with the cornea here. And I literally 
can put it right on their eye and drag it across and they never felt it. And I'll tell you what this was. This was a herpes simplex that was starting to break out. But again, watch out over here. Uh, but that's just showing you that there's decreased corneal sensitivity. As soon as I get close, boom, they blink, boom, they can feel it. Over here, again, whenever I do this, you'll see that they're blinking a little bit. It's not because they're feeling it. They're actually kind of feeling me hit their eyelids and so on and so forth. And literally, they didn't blink here. Look at that, laying that whole fiber across there and now just dragging across. That's how you can check for corneal sensitivity in the practice. All right, so endogenous nerve growth factor uh, is helps with the cornea innovation, tear secretion. And what we're trying to do is, here it is, you can see what this molecule looks like, Senegerman, or this would be endogenous nerve growth factor. And that's what Oxervate is. It's seven vial adapters, 42 pipettes, disinfectant, uh, uh, a recording card. And the, here's Senegerman. Here's endogenous, probably one of my favorite slides is showing you that here it is, a DNA, the sequence spit out through E. coli, twisted up to look like endogenous nerve growth factor or human growth factor protein. And it just exactly looks the same. So really, really cool how that works. So you use it every two hours, six times a day for literally eight weeks um, that's out there. I'm gonna play a video here uh, of a patient. What I wanna point out is it's really weird that they're, they're symptoms. She'll talk about how her eye feels better, but yet it hurts. And that just reminds me of the opioid lecture that I do, and there's all different types of pain receptors. I'm not gonna play these all for the, for the time factor, but let me just play one of these so you can kind of hear. All right, here we are one week into Oxervate. And we have a patient that's going to give us her experiences of what's going on. So why don't you just jump into your your list there and tell us what you got. Okay, I've noticed that my eyes have become much more sensitive to the light. I barely need any tears at all. I, I've used them once a day and one day I did not use any at all. So she said they're sensitive to light. My, eye, my eyeballs themselves feel sore when you move your eyes or open and close your eyelids. So sore. Um, but I no longer have the sensation that there's something in my eye. They, they. Um, but now they feel better. Are very soothing. <laughs> now they're soothing. And they feel better. And you're so, using what type of tears? I'm using Refresh Optum. Usually, I finish the eye drops, the last one for the day, is at 6.30 in the evening, and usually by 9 or 10 o'clock, I use one drop of the, the Refresh Optum. And that okay, I'm going to play the next video so you can kind of hear the comments. All right, here we are with our uh, weekly follow-up with this our This is week three. We have... Uh, Time zero up here, and then we have a week after Oxervate, and then two weeks, and you can see we had a nice improvement today uh, with the with the SPK with Oxervate. So let's swing over here to our patient, and how how's there any difference between last week and this week, or since we started? The biggest difference is I can now read. Um, any time of the day I would choose, I can see clearly, and it, it's a big improvement. And my eyes feel good. The eyes feel good. It was so. Other than that, you said there's really been just status quo since last week. Yes, the correct? the still a little bit of discomfort. Nothing, nothing bad. Good. And I'm very happy with it. Good. And this is. So basically, right, here we are with our... oh, hold on. There we go. So basically, you know, she's telling us that you know. Or, her foreign body sensation, but she's getting feeling back to her eyes. That's right. Remember, these people are neurotrophic. You tested them and now they're starting to get feeling back. So I kind of think of it as, you know, you cross your leg and your leg goes asleep. And also when you uncross, it's like, wow, that really hurts as the blood flow is starting to flow through there. So what they found was um, after eight weeks of treatment, six times a day, that every two hours, that 72% were completely healed 
uh, after after the study here. And so, you know, Oxervate is, you know, I found it to be very, you know, useful in the practice for uh, neurotrophic uh, keratitis. So let me move in quickly here, because I know we're getting close about, uh, I don't know, let's say about 12 or 13 minutes here uh, to where we uh, need to land this plane. So let me go through thyroid disease. And I have a whole thyroid lecture, and I think we've already given it. So if you want to take a deeper dive, it should be on our uh, on our uh, YouTube channel. But, you know, remember that thyroid dysfunction, um, you know, it's the thyroid releasing, talking to the, to the uh, anterior pituitary, producing thyroid stimulating, producing T3 and T4. And, uh, you know, it's a receptor disease where these antibodies are formed uh, that are out there. And I'm just going to skip this question is, what is the most common cause of thyroid dysfunction? All of these will cause patients to be on Synthroid, cancer, surgically induced medication, and pregnancy, but autoimmune is meaning that you're make, making immunoglobulins that are antibodies that then go and attack the receptor. And then unfortunately, the orbit of the eye looks like thyroid tissue. So- but, Ray, I'm sorry, you, I'm sorry to interrupt your, your momentum, but just to finish up the last topic, uh, the question, a question came in, uh, have you ever had a retreat oxervate? Have you done more than one, one cycle? Yeah, that's a great question. I've had probably my N of Oxervate. Uh, I'll say it's as high as 15. Uh, it's probably 12 to 15 patients. And I think I've had two or three patients that needed to have a retreatment. Yeah, that's a good question. And I believe that in their studies, they showed that of those 72% um, that were completely healed, I believe 80% uh, were completely healed after a year. So it's a, you know, you, you're getting down to root cause is that you're fixing the neurotrophic keratitis. Uh, so that really helps out. So yeah, I've had a handful uh, of patients, one or two, uh, maybe as high as three that needed a retreat, but the majority of them are just one and done. Great question. So shifting back over to thyroid dysfunction, um, uh, this whole list here, it's these patients that are autoimmune are the ones that can get the thyroid eye disease in the fact that it's these antibodies that get into the orbit. It's not the T3, T4, it's the antibodies, the congestive part, the congestive part of this condition that cause the problem. So, you know, a lot of times, you know, I'll work with the endocrinologist and they'll be like, they can't have thyroid eye disease. Their TSH, T3, T4 are perfectly normal. How can they have thyroid eye disease? It's because it's this part here, this congestive or inflammatory component, the antibodies that attack the receptors now are attacking the orbit because unfortunately orbital tissue looks like thyroid tissue or the has has the receptors that look like thyroid tissue on the fat and the muscle. So in a sense, these, all these patients have upper lid retraction. And it's just my little way of saying, look, those antibodies that attack the thyroid at the receptor level are now attacking this orbit and creating this an orbital disease uh, that's out there. And here's a patient that came in and she's like, hey, I hear you're pretty good at like this thyroid or this, this eye stuff. And I, she couldn't really figure out what was going on. She's on Lodomax, off Lodomax, on Lodomax. And so we ran the blood work right here in 2017. And she was 344 of the immunostimulating immunoglobulin. And in the reference, 1.3 was normal. And in this reference, 1.7. And you can see here like 300 times higher than what it should be and we were able to solve what was causing a patient's orbital disease. And I'm just gonna go through a bunch of slides here just to remind us that it's lid retraction, soft tissue involvement, it's inflammation uh, to the eye, the Von Grayface sign, the patient looks down, the eyelid stays up because of the, of the uh, inflammation uh, uh, to the muscles and to the, and to the tissues. You can see here the soft tissue involvement with the redness and swelling Superior limbic keratoconjunctivitis 65% of the time is associated with thyroid. But when it's not, it's another rheumatological condition or other autoimmune condition like uh, rheumatoid arthritis uh, in Sjogren's. The periorbital edema is another sign. Again, edema is a sign of inflammation. The infiltrative orbitopathy can occur. It could be unilateral, it could be bilateral. In this patient here, you can see 
is still in kind of the active phase with the redness and swelling. This patient looks to be maybe in a passive phase and the muscles in the orbit being involved. You can see this big, large medial rectus being inflamed here. This is from Elsevier 2005, showing how that inflammation, chronic, low-grade inflammation, creating that type of uh, orbital disease that occurs. So in the past, we had all these treatments of lubricants and, and injection and bone and radiation that's out there. And here's a guy that comes in and he would kind of uh, was, was fooling a lot of people uh, in the area. He had these red eyes and probably because he was older and probably because he was uh, a male uh, that we're, this maybe was trying to sneak through, but you can see the amount of fluid, the edema. He actually has uh, double vision. When he looks to the side, you can see this left eye is not moving. He had double vision. And this is just thyroid eye disease at its best or at its worst. And uh, really, he came in a year too early and kind of take that back. Every time I do this lecture, I got to reach out and call him since I know the dates. We can figure his name. Um, but uh, Tepeza really wasn't out at this point. And so we had to use traditional, I had to use my rheumatologist and put him on IV steroids and oral steroids. And you'll see what happens here over time. You'll see he gets this redistribution of the steroids and the, and the fat. He starts to get that moon face appearance. His eye is quieting down, but he really didn't get in a, a, a significant improvement. We were worried about that compressive optic neuropathy. So I lost him to follow up uh, by going to, to Pittsburgh, but you can definitely see the, the eye turn here that's going on. You can see the moon face uh, that's happening. His symptoms dramatically improved. He felt better, but we were still concerned about that optic nerve uh, on his eye. So, you know, which biologic is indicated, you know, for the treatment of thyroid eye disease? We'll just skip the poll. We'll just move right into Tepeza Teprotumumab. Um, and you know, I was really excited because there was in 2018, I saw that there was going to be this insulin growth factor one receptor antagonist coming out. Uh, and it did come out. It came out by Horizon uh, Therapeutics. It uses a Chinese hamster ovary to produce this. And what it's targeted is this human growth factor one, insulin-like growth factor one, uh, and the... Uh, thyroid stimulating receptors become overexpressed. And that's what it targets. It's actually on the insulin growth factor. I have a nice little picture coming up here showing it, but it's a monoclonal antibody. And you can tell that from up here in the, in the definition, it says teprotumumab. And you can see that it's not that ZU because we, you know, we're kind of in a sense, got some little hamster uh, ovary going on and, uh, um, and moving into how it works, it works into the orbital fibroblasts. We got cytokines and leukotrienes that are being uh, in inhibited here. So really uh, getting down to, in a sense, molecular. So up here, we're talking about the orbit. We're talking about the orbit, it's an orbital disease. What happens is the muscle, the fat, get an overexpression of the thyroid stimulating receptor and the, the insulin growth factor one receptor, but it's really this beta arrestin that really doesn't really matter that if we hit it one side with the thyroid stimulating hormone, it causes the inflammation. If we hit one side with the, uh, with the IGF uh, antibody, it still creates it. So either side doesn't have to have both will trigger the inflammation because this joins these two receptors that are now over that are up regulated. Now what teprotumumab comes in is that it attaches to this, the, 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 the insulin growth factor receptor, remember growth factor one receptor, it's an antagonist and when it attaches, it causes it to downregulate when you hear that. So it doesn't matter if the, uh, the thyroid stimulating antibody come over here and hits it, this overrides it and causes it to downregulate. So really, really cool technology here on how this biologic kind of being a very specific missile gets in here. So you've heard me talk about Remicade and Humira. Uh, being really first generation, you know, they're really immunosuppressive. We start moving into immunomodulary 
uh, with the tapeza, a little bit more gentle on the eye. And there's that fully humanized uh, proteins. And we're talking le less to no sensitivity, as opposed to when you start getting into other chimeric molecules using mouse and human protein here. So Remicade, mouse and human, higher allergy down here, all human, uh, which decreases it. Again, working on the myofibroblast and the hyaluronic acid. Lots of studies out there, again, to bring it to market. There are the optics and optics S. Really the key is knowing this clinical activity score. We used to talk about no specs in the LIMO classification. Really, you wanna learn the clinical activity score. That's what they use to bring it to market. Also looking at ptosis, double uh, proptosis, uh, diplopia and the Graves optimo uh, optimopathy score, quality of life score to bring it to, 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 um, uh, to market. And again, the clinical activity score is really the way to, to, to learn this because if you're gonna refer a patient you at least want three, you can have one to make the referral. The insurance company probably won't pay for it unless it's three or four. So I usually work with the infusion site that's out there. Some of the side effects, look, hyperglycemia because it's an insulin-like growth factor one receptor antagonist. So you can get hyperglycemia as a side effect that's out there and an infusion site reactions. Now here's the clinical activity score. This is what was used in the, in the study, but also um, this is a scale of one, 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 one. There's 10 things here, but they're all worth one point. So if you have uh, a score of three, patient has pain behind the globe. Pain can be anything, an itch, you know, it can be mild, so on and so forth. Pain is very um, you know, subjective. So painful feeling, pain on attempted gaze, we have uh, redness, redness of the conjunctiva, chemosis, any of these totaling three or four, call, I work with the infusion site and then send them over. Basically eight, nine, and 10 are after they start the treatment. So let me show you this gentleman here. That's why I said he came in kind of a year too early because painful feeling behind the eye, yes, Pain on attempted gaze, yes. Redness of eyelids, yes. Redness of conjunctiva, yes. Chemosis, inflammation, he was seven for seven. You can see the caruncle and uh, inflammation of the pleca. So he would be a seven. He was a perfect candidate uh, for uh, tepratunumab. And I bring this up is that because other rheumatologists and other professions out there uh, before Tepeza came out, we're using some big boys here, and you might be seeing these tumor necrosis factor alphas being used, these interleukin-6 being used uh, for these patients, and now you can let them know that there's kind of more of a gentler type of treatment that's out there. Uh, it's really anyone that has any really form of thyroid eye disease. Just go to their website, find out where their next or the closest infusion site is for you when you wanna use this. I know we're right at that 950. I just have a couple slides here. I'll hit these real quick, um, just because these are biologics that do have ocular um, uh, implications. I think we all hear of Humira on, the, uh, on TV, uh, but it also is indicated on label for uveitis that's out there. So just be aware that it does have an in indication uh, it's more of a pan-uveitis, posterior uveitis. I've had a handful of these patients in this rheumatological uh, practice that come over and we've used Humira in an on-label type of usage for out there. So be aware that Humira does have an ocular indication, infectious, non-infectious, uh, posterior pan-uveitis, obviously non-infectious because you're shutting down that immune system that's there. So one of the main reasons that someone with a uveitis or a pan-uveitis is macular edema uh, is why their vision decreases. So just be aware that it's out there and it does have a, uh, a biosimilar. As you can see, before it came out, there's no four letters, but there is a biosimilar here, this had lima, and they added the BWWD to it because it looks exactly the same and it has the same exact name. So how would you tell? Uh, that's out there. It does have a black box warning. 
Actemera is another usage that's out here. Tosolizumab, MAB, monoclonal antibody, ZU, uh, 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 fully humanized, that's out there, or made in human, in a sense. And uh, you can see here, interleukin-6, tumor necrosis factor, T cells, B cells, all in that adaptive immune system, and Actemera targeting those signs, but it has a GCA implication. It doesn't replace the steroids. When used in conjunction with giant cell arteritis, it decreases the steroid load, decreases the reoccurrence. So just be aware if you see someone with uh, giant cell arteritis, they're still going to use steroids. Actemera has been able to step in, decrease the steroid load, decrease the reoccurrences that are out there. And that's what this is all saying in these slides. Again, compared to the placebo and compared to uh, the, uh, uh, the tocilizumab, we were able to use, again, lower amounts of steroids and lower amounts of remission in 26 and 52 weeks compared to just the steroid usage patients. And again, the cumulative dose was much lower in the tocilizumab. You can see 1862 versus almost 4,000 or 3,200. Again, that's a lot of steroids, a lot of side effects. You saw what happened to my guy with the fat redistribution that was out there. So Actemera is used, biosimilars and now biobetters are coming out there. So be aware of that. Biobetters are now better than the original reference molecule. So biosimilars, bi biologics, biosimilars, biobetters, uh, that's, that's out there. And there is now a new BioViz that's out there, which is Lucentis, that is a biosimilar. That one was just approved in 2021. So now we're starting to get into the uh, anti-VEGF with biosimilars. So with that being said, I want to wrap this up and just say thank you and ask Joe if there's any uh, questions uh, uh, before I say thank you. No, just a, just a comment uh, from somebody who a uh, you know, patient undergoing infusions for I think uh, Tepeza ended up being admitted for uh, very high sugar levels. Greg, yeah, that was terrific. Thanks. I think that yeah. uh, that was really good. I really I really especially enjoyed the uh, the amniotic membrane aspect. I thought that it was really helpful to people. Perfect. Thank you. And I see your your comments, Dr. Shovlin, uh, they, the, the 500 and so on and so forth. That's pretty impressive. So uh, when using BioD, how much antibiotic? Um, uh, when using BioD, how much antibiotic? If I'm using an infectious, usually I don't use uh, a dehydrated. BioD's uh, dehydrated. So I'd have to... Uh, defer to one of my other colleagues on that one for us there, George. So with that being said, let me wrap this up so we can finish on time. Joe and I like to be respectful of your time and we appreciate you showing up tonight. So thank you everyone for uh, taking amniotic membranes and biologics for the eye. All right, so with that being said, we do have a list, Joe and I and Vanessa worked hard the other day putting this all together. We have interactive distance learning courses, basically webinars coming up. Joel, Joe, Joel, Joe is on mixing Joe and NeuroPearls, but Joe is doing NeuroPearls on April 19th at 8 p.m. That will be a Tuesday. You'll see all the Tuesdays are 8 p.m. and the Sundays will be 7 p.m. I'm not going to go through the list here. You can see we got some OCT, we got some glaucoma, jumping down to grand rounds. Again, the glaucoma, I'm going to do a CBD lecture and THC. We'll do some clinical case challenges and some visual field coming up. So and, any and comments? Just, yeah, just a, a brief comment. Uh, the next one, April 19th, is the only one that has actually been built by our web designers. The rest will be coming soon for, uh, for uh, registration. Yep. So that's the right, I guess that's the only one that's on the website, Joe, is that yes. what you're saying? Mm -hmm. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Good point. Uh, interactive distance learning. Joe talked about this at the beginning. Pretty much every state out there other than Florida uh, can do it. Just you have to make sure you know the limits that are out there, whether it's all of your credits now in 2021, depending on whether you're one year, two years, bienniums. So please just make sure you're aware of your 
um, of your state uh, requirements of how much you're allowed to use of webinars or what's now considered interactive distance learning. All right, upcoming live events. We have our Sunshine State Conference coming up in June. Um, we'll take a little note of someone asked about doing a workshop for amniotic membranes. We have Mackinac Island. If you're thinking about going there, um, filling up nicely. So that will sell out. Um, it gets limited space on that island. Uh, Mackinac, or I'm sorry, Nashville, we just found out it won't be the Renaissance. Uh, they double booked. And so we're probably just going to be right down the street, uh, but it's going to, looks like it's going to be hopefully the same weekend, just maybe out of different property. So just stay tuned on Nashville and we'll keep uh, updating that. 2023 lineup, uh, Joe's working hard uh, with a hotel and we just did, looked at a contract last night. Uh, regarding the midwinter getaway in Scottsdale. Looks like it might be in April, maybe to get to a little bit warmer weather. Um, and then Northern Escape, we love Quebec City. We're hoping to get there. And then Strasbourg, France, due to everything going on in the world, we decide to just shut that down for many reasons. Uh, so with that being said, wise guys, it's what's on the credit card. Post-event email tonight, required survey, please complete it. We'll have the handout. Next 24 hours uh, to 48, one to two days, certificate of attendance for those who took it. The replay and post-event survey will be in another email. Vanessa, thank you for being here tonight, uh, being our conference administrator and the COPE administrator wearing two hats. So uh, with that being said, I'm gonna say thank you. It's an honor and a privilege, and I'm gonna let my partner land this, uh, this jet airplane. I think that was a, a, a great, uh, great explanation of biosimilars, uh, biologics, and I thought very helpful for amniotic membranes. You know, as, as we evolve professionally and new technologies come out, it's important that we believe them and embrace them and, and, and you know, not to stay with the old tried and true of banish contact lenses, but using the uh, biologic approach. So thank you, Greg. I thought that was a really great update. Perfect. Thanks, Joe. I'm looking forward to Neural Pearls uh, next Tuesday. So take care, everyone. Be safe. Take care. Bye-bye. Peace and love.